Welcome to the fifth meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee for 2015. Could everyone please make sure that the mobile phones and other electronic devices are silent or switched to airplane mode? The first item of business today is a decision on whether to take item four in private. Item four is a consideration of the work programme paper for the committee. Members agreed? Agreed. That's agreed. Which brings us to agenda item two, which is a consideration of the Council Tax Reduction Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015. They are subject to the negative procedure and will come into force on the 1st of April 2015. The regulations make further amendments to the Council Tax Reduction State Pension Credit Scotland Regulations 2012 and the Council Tax Reduction Scotland Regulations 2012. And before us today, we have two Scottish Government officials, Jenny Brough, the team leader at Local Government Finance and Local Taxation Unit, and Colin Brown, Senior Principal Legal Officer. Jenny, would you like to start us off by giving us a brief introduction to the instrument and what it sets out to do? Yes, of course. Um, good morning and thank you as always for an opportunity to appear before the committee. Um, the purpose of the amendment regulations are to make a number of changes um, to the provision within the Council Tax Reduction Scheme for the 2015-16 year. And some of those amendments are routine amendments that we make on an annual basis, for example, to apply the UK Government's annual uprating of Social Security benefits. And others are some minor corrections to the provision of the scheme regulations which we laid in 2012. And there are also some amendments which reflect evolving policy positions um, in Scotland, such as the introduction of same-sex marriage, whereby referencing in the regulations has to be updated. And finally, there are also some amendments to the provisions of the Council Tax Reduction Review Panel, which is a review of Council Tax Reduction decisions which was set up in 2013. So essentially, there are a number of different types of amendments within the regulations, but all of those have been designed to prepare the scheme for 2015-16. Um, does anyone have any questions? Margaret? If you, just, if you could clarify for me, uh, at paragraph 6, it mentions uh, new amendments are also made to the Council Tax Reduction Scheme. And then it goes on, extending the classes of persons who do not need to be habitually resident in the UK in order to be able to qualify for a Council Tax Reduction. Um, I was looking for it within uh, the actual uh, paper that you had provided, but I couldn't find anything that explained that and what the changes were. So if you could maybe tell us what that was. Yeah, of course. Um, so there are elements um, within the initial, well, certain within the council tax benefit regulations, um, which um, were the basis for adapting those to create the council tax reduction scheme. And part of those um, provide an interface between the social security system as it was then um, and the treatment of um, certain home affairs um, provisions such as persons who are entitled to publicly funded support are not entitled. So a good example would be that persons subject to immigration control are not entitled to certain forms of publicly funded support. As far as we could within the council tax reduction scheme, we sought to replicate those provisions for what would be termed persons considered not to be in Great Britain, or not considered to be habitually resident, and therefore are not entitled to council tax reduction. But in this case, there were one or two examples of persons, such as those um, supported by the destitution domestic violence concession, which actually we weren't aware of. Um, and as part of the policy intention, to replicate entitlement as would have existed under council tax benefit, those persons should be included within the scheme as persons who can be entitled to support. So there was an example, um, that's a good example of where we weren't aware of a particular provision that we should have made, in this case around destitution domestic violence concession, that we've now reflected in the scheme to reflect that the restrictions do not apply to that category of person and they can be entitled to CTR. Okay, thank you for that. Anything else? No. Well, there's nothing else we need to do with it. Um, I think the, the committee will agree to note it, but thanks to Jenny Bruff and Colin Brown for coming before us this morning. And I'll suspend for a couple of minutes while we prepare for agenda item three.
Okay, agenda item three is a presentation from Steve Fothergill from Sheffield Hallam University. Welcome back, Steve. Uh, this is the third uh, such report that Steve has completed, completed for us to allow the committee and the wider public to gain a greater understanding of the impact of the welfare reforms in Scotland. In this report, Sheffield Hallam has been able to go a step further and analyse the impact at a household level. Steve, I'll pass over to you to tell us what your findings are and, and uh, any other information you think that the committee might benefit from. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, good morning, colleagues. Um, yes, this is not the first time I've been uh, in front of this committee. It's always a pleasure to, uh, to come up here, but the fact that I keep coming back, I think, is a reflection of the fact that uh, myself and uh, Christina Beatty at Sheffield Hallam have become uh, the go-to people, if you like, uh, who uh, have, have the reputation of understanding and knowing about the impact of welfare reform uh, not just up here in Scotland, but across uh, all parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, now, let me say one or two words by way of introduction to this particular presentation and uh, report. And, and in particular, let me say what it's not. Uh, because with a title like the cumulative impact of welfare reform on households in Scotland, you, you might expect that really we're documenting some sort of uh, tale of woe about the hardship of uh, individuals and, and households. That's not the case. Uh, it's, it's not uh, that sort of exercise. Uh, it is actually uh, very much a, a quantitative uh, exercise in assessing how much uh, people in different sorts of households can expect to lose when the welfare reforms have come to uh, full fruition. Uh, the other thing I would say by uh, way of introduction is that this is not an attempt to in any way pass judgment on the, uh, the reforms. It's a hard-nosed objective look. Uh, it's an attempt to trace through uh, what the impact uh, will eventually be when all of the reforms have, have come to uh, full uh, fruition. I'm sure you have personal views about the reforms. I do, but I hope the uh, uh, sort of objective, independent um, uh, look at this that uh, uh, we've undertaken gives strength uh, to the report. Um, I will just uh, add one further point. Uh, in rereading the uh, report on the train on the way up, I, I became aware that there were, there were one or two tiny inconsistencies between the revised numbers in the report and, and, and the text. And uh, if it's okay with you, Chair, and the rest of your committee, um, when I get back to base, I'd just like to, to iron out those small inconsistencies and give you a slightly revised version of the report that you can mount instead on, on, on the website because I, I'm a little embarrassed by some of the uh, inconsistencies as they, as they stand at present. Anyway, um, Chair, you mentioned that um, I have been here before. Uh, on the first occasion, nearly two years ago, uh, we came with a report which uh, was the first attempt to quantify the financial losses arising from welfare reform uh, in Scotland. And we did that for Scotland as a whole uh, and for each local authority in Scotland. Uh, we came back uh, last year um, with a report that drove those estimates down to uh, the level of electoral wards in all of Scotland's local authorities. Uh, the new report uh, does two things. Firstly, it comprehensively updates all of the estimates and let me say some of the revisions are, are not uh, minor. Um, uh, I will uh, explain more as, uh, that as the talk progresses. Uh, but most importantly, the new report is the first attempt to estimate the impact on different uh, types of households. Uh, this is a list of the um, eight uh, reforms which the re report uh, has covered. Uh, the vast majority of these reforms are reforms initiated by the present coalition government in Westminster, though there are elements of particularly the incapacity benefit reforms uh, which have been working their way through the system uh, in the last two or three years, but which were initiated under the last Labour government. So we've been looking at everything going on simultaneously uh, over the last uh, few years and not simply at those things triggered after uh, 2010. Uh, what's not on the shopping list um, 
the first two there, um, the housing benefit under occupation uh, rules, better known as the bedroom tax, and the changes to uh, council tax benefit. Of course, you reached arrangements up here in Scotland, uh, which have made sure that the, uh, uh, the financial losses arising from those elements of, of the overall Westminster reform package are not being passed on to claimants up here in Scotland. Uh, universal credit is not covered in our uh, study either uh, because it's a fundamentally different sort of reform to the others. It's not about reducing uh, the amounts spent on benefits, certainly not the amounts spent directly on benefits. Uh, it's really a repackaging packaging of existing benefits uh, and indeed in the short run there's a little bit more money put into the pot rather than uh, taken out. Um, I need to go through these steps to explain the basis of all our estimates. Um, everything that we have done starts off with the Treasury's own estimates of the overall financial savings arising from each element of the reforms. Uh, now, the work that we've brought to you previously was based on the Treasury's original estimates of how much they expected to, uh, to save uh, from each element of the reform package. Uh, what has become uh, apparent is that the Treasury has been very gradually um, revising some of its uh, uh, expectations about how much uh, it thinks it will save from different elements of the reform package. And that's why we've had to go back and revisit uh, some of the old numbers that I've shown you last year and, and the year before. And these revisions, I must uh, underline, are really quite significant. Uh, in a number of instances, there were very big changes uh, indeed. But in order to, to work from the Treasury's estimates of financial savings down to the level of Scotland as a whole or individual areas within Scotland, we have to bring in uh, local benefit claimant numbers. That allows us to make that transition. And then in order to work out the impact on uh, different types of households, uh, we've brought together a number of different data sources, uh, in particular the Family Resources Survey, which uh, tells us what is how much benefits different types of households uh, draw upon. I won't go into the finer details of that. It's all set out in the report. What you also need to bear in mind, and I've said this before, is that some of the reforms target households. Other elements of the reform package target individuals. The housing benefit reforms, for example, are about households. The changes to incapacity benefits are about individuals. The figures I'm going to present are uh, for the impact when the reforms are fully implemented. Um, and that term fully implemented is important because the reforms are by no means fully implemented at this stage. Uh, the incapacity benefit reforms in particular are now badly delayed. Uh, you will be aware uh, that there's been an enormous uh, build-up of appeals uh, in relation to the, uh, the work capability assessment and that the prime contractor, ATOS, walked away from, it, from its contract. Now, the cumulative effect of all of that has been to introduce quite a hiatus in the process of implementing the incapacity reforms. And because that element, the work capability assessment element of the reforms, uh, has been delayed, that has knock-on consequences um, for the implementation of the time limiting of um, non-means tested entitlement for those in the work-related activity group. So the whole timescale has been pushed back. What's also uh, needs to be noted is, is that the reforms to DLA, the changeover from DLA uh, to personal independence payments, that is mostly something that is still in the future and won't begin to pick, kick in in a big way until uh, after the general election. So I would say very roughly at this juncture, in the spring of 2015, around about 30% of the total financial losses arising from welfare reform are still in the pipeline. We've not seen everything yet. Um, Final statistical point I would uh, like you to bear in mind is that in all of these estimates uh, that we've uh, produced, 
Everything else is held constant. In particular, we've made no assumptions about uh, lower benefits leading to higher employment, though I will comment on that issue uh, towards the end of the talk. Uh, these are our, are our revised and updated estimates of the overall impact of the reforms uh, on Scotland. Uh, we're now calculating that the total financial loss when all these reforms have come, come to full fruition will be a little over 1.5 billion a year. Uh, the original estimate was around about 1.6 billion a year. In terms of where the hits are coming from, there's, there's quite, a, quite significant shifts in the batting order there. Uh, we were estimating originally that the incapacity benefit reforms would lead to the by far the largest financial losses. The Treasury, Treasury has revised down its estimates of the financial uh, savings there. I think it's because they've taken better account of the compensatory means tested benefits that kick in. Uh, on the other hand, the savings now anticipated from DLA reform uh, and from tax credits have, uh, have increased. Uh, how does Scotland compare with other areas? We're now estimating around about £440 per year as the per adult of working age has been the loss in Scotland. Uh, that's not very far from the GB average. Uh, it's, a, it's less than Wales, less than Northern England or London, but more than in much of Southern England. Uh, but of course, the, uh, the hit in Scotland to claimants would have been somewhat higher. We think it would have been around about the 475 mark uh, per year. Uh, in the absence of the measures which you've introduced up here to uh, offset the bedroom tax and the council benefit, um, council tax benefit reductions. Uh, these are just revised estimates of the, the impact uh, by local authority uh, in Scotland. Um, the batting order hasn't changed very much. I think Glasgow was at the top originally and Shetland was at the bottom. Uh, there have been a few tweaks. I think particularly the, uh, the numbers in Glasgow have come down by about £40 per adult um, of uh, working age per year. Let me now begin to move on to the, the impact on different sorts of households, which is the, the new element of, of, the, uh, of the work. We've always known uh, that different elements of the reform package impact principally on different sorts of households. And we've known reform by reform, benefit by benefit, which are the sorts of households that are most likely to be in the firing line. We know, for example, the first one on that list, that the, the housing benefit reforms in the private rented sector uh, impact on low-income households, mostly working-age low-income households, we know that they have a particularly sharp impact on the under 35s and particularly uh, men under, th under 35 and that they kick in uh, quite strongly for large families. I won't go through all of um, uh, the, uh, the different uh, points, Not, I won't go through them mechanically, just if you cast your eye through, look for the buzzwords like low income, uh, disabled, out of work, older. Um, these are often the, uh, uh, the sorts of groups that we're talking about that are impacted uh, by the various uh, reforms. But importantly, of course, all of these reforms are happening simultaneously. And several of them impact at the same time on the same individuals or households. And that's where... where the new report takes us uh, forward because what we've done is begin to look at how the reforms cumulatively have impacted on different sorts of households. Before I get into those numbers, first of all, let's just look at the, the numbers affected by the different elements of the reforms and how much uh, the average financial uh, loss can be expected to be. Um, some of the reforms, the 1% the uprating, instead of uprating by inflation, affects large numbers uh, of individuals. Um, on the other hand, the financial losses are modest. The freeze which we had 
uh, in child benefit rates uh, up until 2014. That affected all families claiming child benefit, but to, relatively, to a relatively modest amount. On the other hand, at the, at the other end of the scale, the household benefit cap affects small numbers in Scotland, although the average financial losses may be quite large. And in the middle there, you've got incapacity benefit reform and disability living allowance reform affecting really quite substantial numbers and to substantial amounts, around about £2,000 a year typically uh, being the loss. But how does this all work out cumulatively? in terms of impacting on, on, on different households. This particular table is probably the most important table um, in, in the presentation because it shows how the reforms can be expected to work out in terms of their impact on different types of households. There were 15 different types of households in that list and all of Scotland's 2.6 million households can be slotted into one or other of those uh, 15 different categories. Um, towards the bottom of that list, there's quite a group which is other, um, relatively small numbers in, in those categories, I've got to say. Uh, they tend to be households with rather complex structures. Uh, for example, where you may have a parent and a child still living with the, the child's grandparents or, um, uh, or where you've got... Um, let me say, non-standard uh, family units. Um, but the significant point that emerges from this exercise in trying to trace through the, the impact on different types of households is that some types of households escape very lightly on average uh, and others are hit uh, much, much harder. Um, number of points to note. Firstly, pensioner households uh, are barely touched by the welfare reforms. Um, the average financial losses are, are very small. And that's because the Westminster government has uh, deliberately designed uh, the uh, welfare reform package uh, to hit working age benefit claimants and to largely avoid an impact on, on pensioners. Uh, to be impacted by the reforms as a pensioner, uh, you've really got to be either uh, living in the private rented sector and claiming uh, housing benefit, which relatively few pensioners do, or you've perhaps got to be in the slightly unusual position of being over state pension age and still claiming child benefit uh, for, uh, for a child. Um, another group that escapes unscathed from, uh, from the reforms are student households, because students uh, really have very, very little, if any, entitlement to, um, to welfare benefits. Um, on the other hand, what these figures expose uh, are particularly uh, that uh, households with dependent children are hit hard. Um, couples uh, with one or two or more dependent children, uh, average losses in excess of £1,400 a year. Uh, lone parents, um, even larger uh, financial losses. Now I've got to say before we undertook this exercise it wasn't at all clear to us uh, that the, there was such a large impact of the welfare reforms on um, households uh, with children. Um, uh, that was really quite a surprise to us um, and it's caused us to look at why this is actually happening. So here I'm contrasting in, in one column um, lone parents with, with one child with, in the other column, couples with no children at all. And I'm looking at the share of, of households um, in those categories that are hit uh, by uh, each element of the welfare reforms. Now, you look at the, the column there for lone parents with one child. Um, they're all hit by the, uh, uh, the freeze in the value of child benefit. They're all hit by the 1% uprating. 81%, I mean four in five, are hit by reductions in tax credits. Um, the housing benefit reforms in the private rented se sector um, hit 14%, uh, that's one in seven. The incapacity be benefit reforms hit one in ten uh, lone parent households with a child. The disability allowance, uh, living allowance reforms hit a further 7% and so on. Um, whereas you can see that for couples with no children, 
uh, the percentages of, of those types of households hit by each element of the, the reforms, on average, uh, is significantly less. Now, this is not to say that in those households that are hit, those couples that are hit by incapacity benefit reforms or disability allowance, living allowance reforms, it's not to say that those, those households don't face li large financial losses. They do face large losses. But on average, um, uh, lone parents or indeed uh, couples with uh, dependent children are more likely to be hit by multiple elements um, of the uh, financial uh, reforms. Putting all this together, um, the, the figures suggest that around about two-thirds or, or 960 million pounds a year of the total financial loss is falling on households with dependent children. Um, about 40% or 600 million a year is, is falling on the sick or disabled via DLA and incapacity benefit reforms. Um, and those groups also lose from all the other elements of the reform package too. And around about half um, of the financial loss is falling on in-work households. Don't add up those figures together. They, they, the, there is overlap between those groups, but it, it gives you some indication in, in, in very broad terms of the distribution of the financial losses between uh, different sorts of groups. Two-thirds hitting households with dependent children, about 40% hitting the sick and disabled, around half hitting uh, in-work households. Um, are things worse in Scotland uh, than in Great Britain as a whole? Uh, not really. I mean, the, the social security regulations are, are, of course, the same in, in both countries. But if you look carefully down the Scottish column compared with the GB column, you will see that in a number of categories, the, the financial hit in Scotland um, is actually slightly less than the GB average. And that reflects the fact that up here in Scotland, you've found ways of averting the reductions in uh, uh, council tax benefit, and indeed you've averted the impact of the, of the bedroom tax. Um, there are, of course, differences between places in Scotland as well. Uh, the appendix to our new report um, gives you figures for every local authority district um, in, in, in Scotland, I thought it was worth pulling out the contrast between Glasgow and Edinburgh. Now, in both cities, on average, couples and lone parents with dependent children um, face big financial losses, but the financial losses are larger in Glasgow than in Edinburgh, on average. And that reflects the fact that the welfare benefit claimant rate is higher uh, in Glasgow um, than uh, in Edinburgh. Um, this may look like a tale of woe. I suppose in some respects um, it is. Um, but will it be all right on the night? Are we really um, setting the alarm bells ringing unnecessarily? Of course, Westminster ministers um, say that the welfare reforms will incentivise individuals uh, to find work. And if people look for work, they will find work. And therefore, uh, the loss of benefit income will be offset by additional earnings. Well, you do need to bear in mind one or two points. Um, firstly, it's al always been the case that the vast majority of claimants were already um, financially better off in work than on benefits. So there's nothing new about the incentive to be better off by working, uh, though there's no doubt that the, the welfare reforms do increase uh, that incentive. You also need to bear in mind that actually out-of-work claimants do tend to have low skills and poor health, so they're not going to be employers' uh, first choice. And then there is uh, the obvious question, well, where are all of these additional jobs that people are going to go to? Um, I can perhaps see that in certain prosperous local economies, particularly in southern England, or maybe in one or two parts of Scotland, um, additional labour supply triggered by the welfare reforms uh, may lead to employers uh, taking on extra individuals and the overall level of employment might be somewhat higher. 
But as a generalisation, I suspect that doesn't really fit Scotland very well, and I'd be enormously surprised uh, if the reforms did result in significantly higher levels of employment. Having said that, we have no hard evidence on, on this point as yet, and uh, as you, Chair, uh, well know, um, we are intending to pilot some work up here in Scotland to look uh, to see whether there is any evidence that the reforms have led to higher levels of labour participation uh, and employment. Uh, so watch this space on that one. Uh, it's also worth raising the question whether or not these uh, financial losses uh, arising from welfare reforms are being offset by increases in personal tax allowance. I've heard this argument put forward on a number of occasions. Well, there's, there's something in this argument, I've got to say. Um, uh, but you do need to bear in mind that only a proportion of benefit claimants do pay income tax. I mean, clearly... Full-time employees generally do pay income tax, uh, but individuals in part-time low-paid employment are often below tax thresholds. Um, and if you're out of work on bene means-tested benefits, you're generally uh, below tax, tax thresholds as well. Uh, the reductions in uh, or the increases in tax allowance um, also, in quantitative terms, have probably fallen some way short of offsetting. Uh, the financial losses arising from welfare reform. If we make the assumption that the, the personal tax allowance is £1,500 a year higher uh, than it perhaps otherwise would have been, uh, that's worth about £300 a year to a, a sole earner or £600 a year for a double income household. Uh, by way of comparison, we're saying that the uh, impact of the welfare reforms uh, on a household with dependent children in Scotland is, is a financial loss um, a little bit over £1,500 uh, a year. So there's something in the tax allowance argument, uh, but it doesn't uh, go the whole way uh, by any means um, to offsetting uh, the impact of the welfare uh, reforms. And finally, uh, then to, uh, to conclude, um, it's clear from this evidence that some households are far more exposed to the downside of, of welfare reforms uh, than others. Uh, in Scotland, as in the rest of Britain, uh, pensioners and student households escape virtually unscathed. But on average, and I think that word average is important, uh, on average families with dependent children are hit hard, um, and on average lone parents and the disabled are hit especially hard. Uh, these financial losses, these large financial losses, are the result of the cumulative impact of, of the reforms. Uh, looking at any one reform in isolation doesn't give you the full picture. Uh, roll them all together and you begin to uh, see uh, that the impacts are really quite large uh, for certain sorts of households. Thank you very much, Chair. As, as ever, Steve, thanks very much for a very <coughs> comprehensive uh, explanation of the, the research that you've done. Um, and thank you very much for doing it for us. I think it paints a very disturbing picture. Um, you said at the outset that, that you are now seen as the go-to people. Now, you certainly are go-to people in terms of the, the, the information that you're providing, and it's always created a lot of interest and uh, it's, it's certainly given people who have general concerns about the, the impact of welfare reform some real hard facts uh, on which to uh, to base those concerns. But previously, it's my understanding that the DWP have also seen you as the go-to people. They've relied on you to, to provide uh, information for them. But in this case, they have uh, not been very supportive of your research um, and in response to the publication of, of this report they said that you had failed to take into account certain uh, changes which they in, uh, are in the process of introducing or have taken account of. Would you like to take the opportunity to respond to that criticism? Well look, what, what we've done in this report as in the previous um, uh, studies that we've done is we've we've held all other factors constant we're just looking at one bit of the of the world that's changing which is is, is the welfare reforms and tried to trace through 
their particular impact in terms of financial losses. Now, I understand, and, I, and I've only heard this second hand, I understand that what DWP have been saying is that, ah, you're, you know, you're not taking account of the fact that employment levels are increasing um, and that, you know, therefore, people coming, you know, uh, who are hit by the, uh, by the welfare reforms um, are fine, you know, they're, they're re-entering the labour market. Now, Yes, I can, I can see that if the labour market is expanding, it's easier for people to move off benefit and into work. But this is an exercise in holding, you know, in looking at one bit of the, of, of, of the jigsaw. Now, whether or not employment is expanding because of the welfare reforms is, is a separate question. I mean, it's certainly the case that at the present point in time, there is some revival in, in the level of economic activity and employment going on. Uh, but I wouldn't necessarily attribute that to the reforms uh, themselves. Um, I, 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 I think that DWP um, are hiding behind two events, uh, behind an event which happens to be happening simultaneously with the welfare reform, and, and perhaps arguing, therefore, that the, we're overstating the, the downside of the welfare reforms. I mean, if the economy had gone in the other direction, they wouldn't have been able to uh, deploy that argument. Yeah. It's very possibly the case, given other statistics that we're aware of, that some of the people who would be impacted in one column or one particular assessment at the present time, even if they went into a position where they were no longer considered to be unemployed, would still be in receipt of benefits and would only move to another uh, area in which they're, they're going to lose out because there's so much part-time employment, zero-hour contracts. You know, the, the, the number of people who ostensibly have moved from being out of work to in work doesn't necessarily equate into a reduction in the number of people reduce, uh, that, that are no longer uh, dependent on benefits. Is that right? Yeah, that, that, that's certainly the case. I mean, you may move from you know, out-of-work benefits into to receiving in-work in benefits. I mean, one of the big revisions that we've incorporated in, uh, uh, in, in the numbers uh, that I've been presenting today is that the Treasury itself has recognised uh, that, you know, some of the expectations that they first had about the financial savings uh, arising from the welfare reforms didn't allow for the, co for the compensatory benefits which people might get. If they lost one set of benefits, they might end up claiming other benefits instead. And that's particularly why I think that their original figures on the financial savings arising from the incapacity benefit reforms uh, have been so radically reduced, they're now much smaller because they're, they're taking account of the fact that if you've had your incapacity benefit taken away, you know, you, you may find then instead you're entitled for more housing benefit, etc., etc. Uh, another question uh, in terms of the methodology that you used. Um, you said that there were certainly two areas where you hadn't factored in because of council tax reduction and also the, the mitigation of the bedroom tax. They hadn't featured in your analysis here, but one concern that's been raised by some people, especially uh, people in local authorities, is that although the increase in the availability of discretionary housing payment to those who have been impacted by the bedroom tax, the bedroom tax has to, the, the the DHP has to be claimed, it has to be asked for by the the recipient. So, is it possible? that for those who haven't claimed discretionary housing payment, that some of the statistics in here would actually be worse if those people were taken into consideration? Yeah, if the take-up of discretionary housing payment is, is below 100%, um, then we're underestimating the, the impact of, of the reforms. I'm not close enough to the situation up here in Scotland to, to know whether you've got procedures in place uh, that genuinely make sure that all the people... Uh, that should be getting discretionary housing payment are uh, getting it. I mean, I've spoken informally to one or two people who suggest that, you know, they've got the system in place, but whether or not it really is comprehensively in, in place, I, I'm, I'm a little unsure. But certainly it's the case that, you know, we've assumed that the full impact of the bedroom tax is being obviated, uh, which it may not be. Yeah, it's, it's a fair assumption. The money is there for everyone who's been identified, but the... the the DHP has to be applied for, and there, there has some, been some anecdotal evidence that people are reluctant to claim it. So, uh, and, and it might not be huge numbers, but there, there might be people who, for whatever reason, have decided not to claim it. And in that circumstance, that's the question I'm asking. Those people would actually be worse off because 
that that hasn't been factored into some of these overall statistics. Oh, ab absolutely, because we we've taken out the impact of the uh, of of the bedroom tax from from these estimates, and that's one of the reasons why Scotland looks marginally better uh, than England in uh, in a number of the figures. I'll open up to committee members if they want to make points or ask questions of Steve. No, no, no. Claire. Yep. Um, and then Christina. Professor, um, Father Gill, um, the UK government has a, abandoned a quality impact assessment and refused to conduct a cumulative impact assessment on the welfare reform baggage. What is your view on the quality of the information published by the UK government on the expected impact of the welfare reforms prior to their enactment? Right. Um, some of the work that they've published is good. Um, no question ab uh, about that. Um, but it generally falls a long way short of driving down the estimates of the impact either to local areas, you know, Scotland or local areas within Scotland, um, and it fails often in, in driving down the impact to, to different types of households. Um, I think that's where our research m moves at least two, if not three, steps further on from what the, uh, uh, what the DWP um, has produced. It's also uh, become apparent to us that uh, some of the DWP's estimates are now seriously in need of, of, of revision because, um, as I say, the, the, the Treasury itself has been re, uh, changing uh, its estimates of the financial savings, and I don't think that's been translated into you know, new estimates uh, published in the impact assessments uh, by uh, DWP. We've done our very best to take on board those new revised Treasury estimates uh, of the financial savings. Is there an explanation from the Treasury as to why they haven't made the initial expected savings? Um, no, I mean, this is the sort of thing they slip out in, in obscure tables in, in the back of the budget statement or the, um, uh, the autumn uh, financial statement. And really we're left rather surmising as, as to why they've changed some of the estimates. Um, it would seem, as I say, in the context of the incapacity benefit reforms that, that they've now taken fuller account of the offsetting benefits that would kick in if you're losing incapacity benefits. With the DLA reforms, where the financial savings have gone up very substantially, um, reading across several different documents, it seems to us that they're now anticipating far more people to lose entitlement to the successor benefit, uh, personal independence payments, um, far more people will lose entitlement to that than was originally uh, anticipated to be the case. But it's not set out in full. Um, you know, we're as much in the dark as anybody. We can only make an intelligent guess. And just, just f finally, um, um, my colleague touched on in-work poverty being um, of great concern to the committee in terms of the increase in in-work poverty that we've heard in evidence and from some of the... Um, uh, pre uh, presentations and representations that have been made to the committee. Um, do you see in-work poverty increasing as a result of the welfare reforms? Well, look, that, that, I've put this slide back up um, again. Um, look at the third, the third of the bullet points. Um, we're estimating, and it's hard to pin this down with, with precise accuracy, we're estimating that something approaching half of the financial losses arising from welfare reform do fall on in-work households. Uh, now, insofar as those in-work households are skewed towards the bottom end of the income spectrum, you know, even before they lose benefit, then, you know, you would expect that if you're taking money from those households, that it will push them further down into into in-work uh, poverty. It's a little bit more complex than that. I mean, some of the in-work households that are, are losing money are actually, you know, the households with very high earners uh, that lose entitlement to child benefits. So, um, you know, let, let, let's not uh, jump to the conclusion that it's always the poorest who are hit hardest. But, but the, the largest part of that loss, that £730 million a year loss up here in Scotland, I would imagine is falling on... Um, uh, households in work towards the bottom end of the income spectrum. And, and 
would your conclusion be that, that for those people that are moving out of benefit into work, um, as the um, the government um, <coughs> would say was one of the, the reasons for doing this, is to encourage people into employment, that that employment that they, they can achieve is likely to be at the lower end of of the... Well, well given, the, given what we know about out-of-work benefit claimants, um, you know, the fact that they tend to be relatively low-skilled, uh, that they tend to have worked primarily in low-grade manual jobs and that they, you know, they've often been out of work for, for long periods. These are not going to be employers' first choice. You, know, you would expect them to be going into you know, relatively modest paid employment if they can find uh, em employment. And once in that mo relatively modest paid employment, you know, the, one of the effects of the welfare reforms is that they're not entitled to as much in-work benefit as they once uh, would have done. The reductions in tax credits, uh, which have really not received a lot of attention and, and public debate, are a very, very big part of the overall jigsaw. They're much bigger uh, in terms of financial losses than, for example, the, you know, the bedroom tax had it been implemented or, or several other elements of the, uh, of the reform package. In fact, I think in Scotland, there we are, it's, it's, it's the biggest element of the, of the package in terms of the financial losses. Um, uh, yeah, no, no, that, and those tax credits go overwhelmingly to lower paid in work households. Thank you. Okay, I'll come to Joan first because she wanted a supplementary on something that Claire was asking, then I'll go to Christina. Yeah, thanks very much, Convener. Yes, I did want to ask a supplementary to go back a couple of questions when you talked about the Treasury's revising their estimates down in terms of certain savings, but then also predicting an increase in savings uh, in terms of the migration from DLA to PIP. How, given that you've said that the figures is quite difficult to tell why they've revised the, the savings down, how can they be so sure that they'll make the savings on PIP? Uh, to be honest, I don't think they can be so sure. In fact, I'm even slightly sceptical about um, the saving that they're now anticipating on PIP. I mean, I, if I can recall the figure correctly, across the UK as a whole, I think they're now talking of £2.8 a year to be saved once the full transition from DLA to, uh, uh, to PIP has uh, uh, come into force. And again, if I can remember the figures correctly, I think the original anticipated saving was only one and a half billion a year. So they've almost doubled their anticipated saving. Now, what I do know when I look at some of the detailed figures underpinning that is that they've upped the numbers uh, who they expect not to be eligible for, uh, for PIP from 450,000 to 600,000. That's, you know, 600,000 people who would have been eligible under the old DLA system will no longer be eligible on, on, under PIP. But that doesn't quite get us, um, you know, right the way up to 2.8 uh, billion. I, I, I'm a little sceptical. Uh, I, I, the more I look at some of the Treasury's figures, the more I think there's an element of back of the envelope or, or, or in, in some of them. Forgive me if you don't mind, is this a supplementary on the supplementary convener? If you forgive me for sounding a bit cynical, it, it strikes me that this uh, this might be an arbitrary figure um, in terms of the savings on PIP in order to make up for the fact that they have shortfalls in other areas and that rather than based on need, this, this uh, increased figure of those who are not entitled could be completely arbitrary based on the Treasury's need. We have a footnote in, in the new uh, report for you, which is our best assessment as, as to what the Treasury has actually done here. Uh, we think that when they're anticipating 600,000 people being taken off uh, uh, DLA, they've looked at that 600,000 as a proportion of the, the total number of claimants, and I think it's about a quarter or thereabouts, and they've therefore cut the... Uh, uh, the expected spending on uh, DLA by a quarter. Um, I can see why they've done that calculation, but it's a bit fanciful, I've got to say, because if the system is working as it should work, the people who will get moved off DLA, or rather will not be entitled to personal independence payments, uh, will tend to be the people towards the less disabled end of the spectrum, 
who often are entitled to lower amounts of DLA uh, than those with very high levels of disability, you know, who are on DLA now and will stay on PIP in the future. So I think some, some Mandarin in, in Whitehall has probably made a simple assumption which is a little bit wide of the mark, and they may be too optimistic about the savings. Whether or not it's been done for cynical reasons, I, I couldn't comment, I'm, I'm afraid. But I, I think technically they may have got it wrong. But we've had to, in everything we've done here, we've worked, we've started from what the Treasury itself thinks it's going to save. Uh, and, and we've had to have very, very good reasons if we've tweaked those numbers. Christina. Thank you very much, convener. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Fothergill. I think um, your, your report has, has given us some very, very interesting and, and quite stark reading, if, if you don't mind me saying. Um, on table six of, of your report, um, I was drawn. My attention was drawn to the impact on households with children, and then drilled down a bit to lone parent households with one dependent child or two or more dependent children. Sometimes these households are the ones that are furthest away from the job market and would incur substantial childcare costs should they enter the job market. The Scottish Women's Budget Working Group and the Fawcett Society have both done sort of a gendered analysis on some of these impacts. And I just wondered whether, you know, I, I would suspect that 170,000, if you join up the two lone parent categories, with the biggest Im impact, you know, financially of £1,850 of a loss, whether there's been any, you've done any gendered analysis on this and whether the majority of them are women. And is that the real reason for not um, continuing with equality impact assessments? Um, I think it's a reasonable assumption that most lone parent families um, are headed by, by women. I mean, it's not exclusively the case, but the majority will be. Uh, so insofar as we are identifying a, a large impact on, on, on lone parents with dependent children, um, they will be households headed, headed by women. A ab absolutely um, uh, the case. We haven't done um, any gender analysis, uh, un unfortunately. And there are many different ways the overall stock of households uh, you know, and the, and the population out there could be could be divided up. Um, I mean, it, the on, in Table Six, we've used the fifteen categories of different types of households mm -hmm. that the census of population uh, defines. But we could have possibly split um, split up by, uh, by by gender or by ethnicity or or or, or, what, or age or whatever else. Um, uh, but we've done what we've done. Now, I, I, I'm afraid. I'd be very keen to see. Uh, the analysis to which um, you're referring, I think it uh, may shed uh, additional uh, light. Um, but on the general issue of women, I mean, given that lone parents are hit particularly hard, and given that we also know that women often occupy uh, a lot of part-time jobs and a lot of low-paid jobs, and part-time and low-paid do often go hand-in-hand, it's not difficult to hypothesise that um, a very substantial impact of the over portion of the impact will fall on women. Thanks for that. Um, I think maybe this, this committee might be minded to hopefully in the future look at look at some of those details, and that's something I would I would welcome. You said that um, uh, around about thirty percent of the overall welfare changes are still in the pipeline, and then the impact that would have again on the most uh, vulnerable. Um, one of the things that drew my attention as well was I'll, I tend to do a lot of gendered um, analysis, but I've uh, noticed that in your um, report, the groups typically most affected in housing benefit in the private renting sector was under 35s, mainly men. And I have to say that one of the things, even locally, uh, anecdotally, and, 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 um, and I believe some of the evidence that this committee's had previously, that that group are becoming 
a pretty vulnerable group and, and as much as they seem to be the group where there's the biggest rise in the access to food banks, they seem to be the group that su are subject much more to benefit sanctions mm -hmm. and therefore mm -hmm. pushed you know, 12 weeks off benefits into quite difficult situations. And certainly in the area that I represent, there's a real correlation between that age group and the rate of suicide, which takes it another step uh, further. And I would just, you know... It, 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 it baffles me and it, it's very, very disconcerting that maybe, again, there's, there's, there's a, a headline figure there, but the impact of that headline figure is maybe something we should be looking much, much more closely at, given the, the impact it was maybe having on young men who probably you know, react with difficulty to the system, but um, you know, don't get the best out of the system either. Yeah. Um what our, all our statistics are here are averages for the impact. You know, I, I mean, take, take single-person households. Um, I'm, I'm, we're giving you an estimate of the average impact, uh, you know, on all single-person households um, of, of, of working age um, there, which is, I think, £490. Now, that doesn't mean to say every single-person household is losing £490. It actually could mean, you know, that... Um, you know, some single-person households are lo losing 5,000, and a great many are losing nothing at all. In fact, that's actually likely to be the case. I mean, these, these are all averages, and they, they expose... They, 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 hide, they hide enormous differences at the level of individuals, you know, where circumstances vary um, such a lot. And, um, you know, we haven't looked at it directly, but it, it seems... It seems reasonable what you're saying about the impact on um you know under 35 uh, males i mean they are a group uh, that are exposed to the housing benefit reforms in in the private rented sector uh, yes certainly if they uh, claim job seekers allowance and then have been subject to uh, to sanctions uh yeah they are they are seriously in the firing line sanctions have not been incorporated into our financial savings here by the way um, I think it's only really become apparent to us in, in recent months just quite what scale the, the sanctions are building up to being. Um, uh, I, I haven't got a handle on how much financial savings um, uh, come, come through sanctions, but for the individuals affected, you know, this is very, very serious indeed, of course, because this, this, this means that they're losing their... Uh, uh, their financial support entirely. I mean, I think I understand, you know, the, the premise of your, your report and the, and, and the fact that, it, that it's averages. I think some of the work that this committee's done, speaking directly to people who have been, been affected by sanctions, um, is, you know, I extremely worrying. And your, your work complements that as far as, you know, backing up that, that evidence. But we've done some work in this committee on the impact of individuals on sanctions, and we're continuing that, that work too. So... Um, hopefully, with working together, we can we can drill down and, mm. and look at that a bit closer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Kevin. And I'll, I'll just follow on from that point that um, Christine has made, and uh, Professor Father Gill, glad to see you again. In the report, um, in your concluding remarks, you say that average losses can, of course, still hide a great deal. What kind of things uh, are we talking about that? that are hidden in terms of, of, of some of the, the, the big impacts that there are in certain <coughs> households. Right, all, all of these are average statistics. When I, when I was presenting the, um, let's get, go back to the key table. Um, yeah, that, that, that's the key table in the whole report. You know, the, the av average losses for different sorts of, of households up here in, in, in Scotland. You know, this is the basis of me, me saying that you know, if you're a pensioner household or a student household, you're, you're getting away almost scot-free. If, you, if you're, you've got dependent children, you're, you're in the firing line. Now, now, take that line, couple no children. You, know, you can think, oh, on, on average, a loss of £380 um, for, um, for those types of households. Oh, we needn't worry about couples with no children. Hang on a minute, that's, that's not actually the case. That average probably reflects the fact that there are enormous numbers of couples with no children who are completely immune to the, the welfare reforms. They don't impact on them at all. But um, if you're a couple um, and you are perhaps both drawing on 
uh, incapacity benefits, and you do find some older working age households who fall into that category. And if one or more is also drawing on disability living allowance, um, then you are seriously in the pipeline. Uh, in the very worst instances, uh, it's not difficult to conceive of some households where the financial loss might be six or seven thousand pounds a year. Um, which to underline the point again, you know, the averages disguise a lot as well as I I informing you. Just as, you know, we shouldn't assume that all lone parents with one dependent child lose a large amount of money. I mean, some lone parents uh, with dependent children are in employment and in decently paid employment and may lose very little at all. Uh, others may be losing much, much more than that figure that we've got of £1,770 uh, a year. Um, you have to treat these figures cautiously and understand what they're saying. They're not telling you that every lone parent loses that amount, that every couple with no children loses that amount. They are averages. They give you some indication as to which groups in the population are, on average, uh, being hit hardest. Uh, I thank you very much for that. That's very useful. Um, and the same average scenario applies across local authority areas because obviously in my own local authority area in Aberdeen, uh, some of the average impacts are pretty low, uh, but we have fairly high uh, employment rates in, in that neck of the woods. So that average uh, also has to take into account that high employment rate. So there will be folks who are as badly affected um, in Aberdeen as there are in Glasgow. Absolutely correct. There, there, there will be folks who are as badly affected in Aberdeen as, as in Glasgow. The point about Glasgow is simply in relation to Glasgow's population. There are more of them. There are more of them in absolute terms in the Glasgow and relative to the population uh, as in, in, in Glasgow as a whole. You know, the, the claimant rate is, is higher. But if you're hit by, uh, by these welfare reforms, I mean, you, the, the, the pain is going to be as great for an individual or a household in Aberdeen as it is in Glasgow. I think that's extremely useful, um, and uh, thank you for that uh, explanations, which have simplified things, because sometimes, you know, uh, some of that is, is lost when folks um, uh, read uh, reports which deal with averages. Um, if we could look at the impact on subgroups, and I think, you know, um, it makes shocking reading uh, for, for many folks who have not probed into this uh, in as much depth uh, as we had. The fact that almost half uh, of, of these impacts fall on in-work households is often a surprise to the general public. Uh, the fact that 40% uh, of the impacts fall on sick or disabled people, I, I think, also comes as a surprise to, to the general public. Uh, and the fact that two-thirds of, of these financial losses will impact on, on those households with dependent children, again, would shock a number of people. Can I ask if, um, if these um, levels... Um, are uh, typical uh, across Great Britain as a whole or are there any differences uh, between Scotland uh, and the rest uh, of England and Wales uh, in regards uh, the impacts on those subgroups? I can't give you a totally accurate answer there because we've not replicated this exercise um, across um, several different parts of, um, of Great Britain. We have replicated it in Sheffield, actually. In fact, uh, this exercise in Scotland has benefited from being done on the back of uh, pilot work that we undertook for Sheffield uh, City Council. Uh, and I've got to say that in, in, in Sheffield, which in terms of the GB average is pretty average, you know, the, the, the financial losses overall are not sky high, nor are they particularly low. Um, the, the pattern of losses... It's not fundamentally dissimilar to that that we were identifying uh, in, in Scotland. Um, uh, in Scotland, the precise figures will be a little bit different because, of course, whereas in Sheffield, they've got the council tax benefit reductions kitting, kicking in and the 
bedroom tax kicking in, you've averted those impacts up here. So, so in detail, they, 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 would be diff they would differ, but the general thrust is, is remarkably similar, um, that it, it's households with dependent children losing out uh, very heavily, not least because of things like the, uh, the tax credit changes, the sick and disabled because of the big changes to DLA and, 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 and incapacity benefits, um, and in work households because you know they're they're losing at several levels. I mean, not least through the, the tax credit uh, re reductions. Um, yeah, uh, I, 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 Scotland's not not unusual. I don't think so, but I couldn't actually prove it. I'd have to go away and do some more numbers. But we do have the advantage of having the council tax reduction um, and the bedroom tax mitigation that other places, uh, well, some places uh, do have if their council has, has dealt some, with the council tax uh, situation. Uh, but most of them have passed on the cut, I would say. Is that right? Um, yeah, Scotland and Wales have both found arrangements not to pass on the council tax benefit uh, reductions. A number of specific local authorities in England have gone down the same route as well, where they've absorbed the hit uh, within, uh, within their own budget. Uh, but it is the case that uh, the va in England, the vast majority of authorities have simply passed on the, uh, uh, the reduction to, um, to tenants. Um, this particular table that I've put up on, on, on the screen, um, which is comparing the financial losses in Scotland in, and in Great Britain. I mean, bear in mind, that overall we're saying that you know the, the hit up in Scotland is not very far off the national average, um, but then when you look at individual categories of uh, of, of households, you see that Scotland is distinctly lower than than GB on uh, the hit on lone parents, uh, lone parents with one or or, or two children. Um, it's uh, da -da -da. That, that's that's perhaps the most significant one in which it's. Um, uh, below the uh, uh, the GB average, I suspect that owes a great deal to the decision up here not to uh, implement reductions in council tax benefit. Uh, you know the the orders of magnitude uh, difference there. Um, you know probably are attributable to uh, to that particular decision here. Yeah, I mean you've not you've not averted the whole impact on on loan payments, but you've shaved you know a good hundred to two hundred pounds off it. Yeah. Um, finally, uh, convener, uh, can I can I first of all thank you, Professor Fothergill, Fothergill, once again for the work that you've put in. Um, I think it's been extremely useful again for us to to uh, have uh, um, uh, the the opportunity to to look at uh, the areas of work that you're doing, and particularly the specifics to Scotland. Uh, I can imagine that the Member of Parliament for Sheffield Hallam will be uh, particularly happy with some of the research that you're doing at this moment in time, uh, but I hope that the Deputy Prime Minister does pay some attention uh, to the work that goes on in his constituency in this regard. Um, I, I, obviously, we've heard from the, the convener already that <coughs> Um, there has been attempts to discredit some of your work uh, from the Treasury, it seems. Um, can I ask you if other bodies are, are looking closely at, um, at your findings, in particular those uh, bodies that are, are dealing um, with child poverty matters? Um, because I, I really do feel um, that the fact that two-thirds of the total financial loss here are borne by households with dependent children um, is pretty sickening, it has to be said. Um, and obviously, uh, when we have made so many strides to try and eradicate child poverty, it seems that what we're doing is actually going to increase that in the future. Mm. Um, I would say that when other people have replicated the sort of calculations that, that we've done, um, and we were there first, I've got to say, but when they have replicated our sorts of calculations, they've generally come up with figures that are not fundamentally different to, to those that uh, we've been coming up with. I know that we publish figures for Wales uh, at the same time as we publish short, the original estimates for, for Scotland, I mean, back in April 2013. And, and the... the uh, the Welsh Government 
um, undertook its own study of the impact of, uh, of, of the welfare reforms. Now, once you allow for differences in what we put in to what they put in to, to, to the pot, actually, the, the figures that they came up with, about nine months behind our figures, uh, were remarkably similar. And, and, and that gives me confidence and gives us confidence uh, that we've got it right. Um, and um, if we are being challenged by DWP or the Treasury, I think it's not because we've somehow got the figures wrong, but rather that they don't like what they're hearing, or they perhaps um, are trying to take a broader view of what's going on in the world than, than we've done here, which is to try and just quantify one element of what's happening out there in, in the world and not sort of simultaneously adjust for changes in tax levels and employment levels and, and, and benefit levels all, all at the same time, but just look at one element of, of, of the jigsaw. <laughs> thank you very much. Margaret. Thank you, convener. And thank you for your report and your presentation. It has been a, a bit of an eye-opener and certainly quite devastating for a lot of families uh, here in Scotland and across the UK, as you know. I wanted to ask a question on tax credit. Um, is that, and I mean, indeed, are all of your figures based on 100% of the people who are entitled to claim claiming? Because particularly in tax credit where people are perhaps in zero-hour contracts and they've maybe got a 20 hours work one week and 10 the next, and so there'll be a, a huge variance in the actual amount of tax credit that they would be entitled to and have to re claim and you know which is very difficult many for many people who are in that situation uh, having to continually fill in a uh, claim forums and uh, I just wondered if you have just taken a hundred percent of those entitled to in your figures so in actual fact the figures could be worse um, than they appear because not everyone who is entitled to the money is claiming it. Hmm. Let me explain how we get to that figure of a 350 million a year loss to Scotland through, through, through tax credits. And, and this should answer your question. What we do, we start off with the Treasury's revised estimates of how much they expect to save through the, the tax credit uh, changes and there's a whole raft of uh, raft of them. You have to add up endless numbers to 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 get to a, a GB wide uh, estimate of the savings. Then we look at where tax credit claimants live across Britain, and we get the figures on where tax credit claimants, how many tax credit claimants there are in 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 Scotland. And that allows us, when we look at Scotland's proportion of the GB total, to derive a figure for the financial losses um, in, in, in Scotland. Um, so that 350 million that we're estimating uh, for the financial losses in Scotland reflects Scotland's share of tax credit claimants. Now, I suppose, given the method we followed, we're basing our statistics on people who actually claim tax credits. Um, uh, it may be the case that some people are not claiming the tax credits uh, that, that they're entitled to. Um, um, I'm not sure what that would do to the numbers. I'd have to... Um, well, if they're not getting the benefits, they're not going to be losing the benefits, are they? Uh, so it's not really going to affect the numbers. Uh, and if, let's say, it's the same proportion not claiming tax credits up in Scotland as in other parts of, um, of, of the United Kingdom, then it's not particularly going to affect the estimates that we've generated for, um, for, for, for Scotland. 
Um, so I, I, I recognise the process that you're talking about, but I don't think it distorts the numbers that we've, we, we've got here. I mean, to lose tax credits, you've got to claim them in the first place. That's perhaps the easiest answer. Yeah, and, you know, is the Treasury assuming that everyone claims, well, they're just going on the figures of historic claims, I presume, and that's how it's done? I, I, I would assume so. I mean, I'm not privy to the inner workings of, of the Treasury um, on, on this, but I, I would assume they look at um, you know, how many people are claiming tax credits, how much they claim, and then they do, do a calculation. If we take 10% off, what does it, uh, what it, was, what does it uh, mean uh, in terms of financial savings? Um, yeah, yeah. Maybe somewhere people, behind the yeah. scenes they do have calculations mm -hmm. of, um, of you know, households that are entitled but not claiming but it wouldn't impact on these figures, would it? Because these are losses to people who are claiming. Hmm. So the more people who are um, in work and perhaps for one reason or another find themselves not getting the benefit they were previously getting and find they've got to accept a zero-hours contract job, um, they are not being counted anywhere, are not being actually considered in any of these figures. If you're, not, if you're not claiming something, you wouldn't be counted in, 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 in this, even if you really should be claiming something. If you something. were coming off an employment benefit, for example, and going into zero hours contracts, work, and tax, tax credits, you would, there's that change in benefit. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you should be entitled to, to, to claim tax credits, whether people actually do mm -hmm. consistently. Um, I couldn't give you an ac accurate answer in terms of the proportion that fail to claim. Um, that's, that's not territory I know well. Um, but there will be some people who are not getting the benefits they're entitled to. That applies to any benefit that you've got to claim for, um, uh, mm -hmm. of, of course. I mean, we can't assume that everybody gets the housing benefit that they're, they're, they're entitled to. You know, some people may not claim. Uh, but yes, yeah, there were people not getting money. Could I ask a question? It's not in the report. It's around benefits and something that I had read somewhere that when you become a new pensioner claimants, um, currently pensioners, say, for example, a 70-year-old lady in a council house, three bedrooms, She's not affected by the bedroom tax. But someone who becomes a pensioner now and is still living in a three bedroom house just on her own, uh, they would not they would be affected by the housing benefit uh, bedroom tax. They wouldn't get that allowance that the current so new claimants, pensioner claimants have to pay the bedroom tax? I'm not an absolute expert on that, but what you're saying to me sounds very logical, that um, you know, some of the impacts of welfare reforms that have been implemented for the working age population <laughs> will eventually transmit into the uh, population above st uh, state pension age. Uh, that does seem logical. Um, I've certainly thought of this in the context of the disability living allowance reforms because the changeover from DLA to PIP is being implemented only for those people of working age. But of course, you know, a 55-year-old 10 years on becomes of state pension age. So eventually you would expect that to then feed through to the numbers above state pension age who are entitled to to PIP, you know, the, the DLA successor. Um, uh, but I, I would really have to dig down and look at the fine details, um, uh, and I'm not familiar with those, but it, it, it seems a reasonable expectation that, uh, that that's what will happen. So then the pensioners would actually... Yes, the, the, the pensioners, will, yes, like, like pensioners will eventually be affected by the DLA reforms. Um, uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Annabelle. Thank you, Convener. Good uh, morning, Professor um, Father Gill. I notice in the um, report at page 7 it says that, and you refer to this, in estimating the impact of the welfare reforms, the report holds all other factors constant. But it, 
is that a is that a reliable um, assumption to make? Because it is the case, for example, in Scotland, we have seen, thankfully, um, falling unemployment and rising employment. And I think the figures last quoted were, since 2010, about 187,000 uh, new jobs. <clears throat> so is that not of some relevance to the, the calculations and the extrapolations you make from the calculations in your report? Yeah, I, 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 this, there are several things going on, on simultaneously um, out, out there in the world, and we've just been looking at one bit of, uh, of the jigsaw. Um, I did try to say earlier, but I maybe rather failed to, to get the message across, is that um, yeah, we recognise that employment has been increasing. You know, there has been an upturn in, in, in the economy. But whether or not that, uh, that increase in employment is any, in any sense triggered by the welfare reforms, I think there's a question mark there. We, we, we don't know. I mean, there's lots of other things that, again, again have triggered the, the, uh, uh, the increase in employment. And the, the work which uh, we're going to undertake next, uh, where I'm, being a, I, I'm able to bring some university resources to bear to, uh, to support a small contribution from the, uh, from the Welfare Reform Committee, is to look very closely whether or not there is any evidence uh, that the welfare reforms specifically have led to increased levels of labour market engagement and increased levels of employment. I mean, there's a lot happening simultaneously all the time in the world. Um, and, and, you know, it, 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 it's a fair comment that, you know, well, you haven't taken account of X or you haven't taken account of Y. Well, yes, I'm sorry. We've just looked at the impact of the reforms. But I, I do want to explore, and I think we, need, we all need to explore, whether the welfare reforms are indeed feeding through to higher levels of employment or whether the higher employment, which you know, we can now see out there in, in, in the economy, there's been, there's been something of an upturn over the last couple of years, we can't deny that, whether those higher levels of, 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 of employment have, have nothing at all to do with, um, with, with the welfare reforms. With, they, they may be to do with increasing amounts of credit or exports or whatever else, but you know, we, need to, we need to probe as, as to whether or not there's some substance in that argument that welfare reforms will encourage people to look for work and therefore they will find work and therefore employment will be harder, higher. That's what we, we need to explore, whether that really is happening. Um. On the treatment of the um, the up rate, the one percent up rate, yeah. um, and I think you observe that, you know, against falling inflation, that's not delivering a saving. But is the converse of that not that the up rate in that context is a benefit to a to a welfare claimant because the alternative would have been a lower um, rate of inflation being applied? Yeah, I mean, we we have. This is one of those instances where we've actually gone and we have revised the, the Treasury's own figures because the Treasury has not come out with a new figure uh, for the expected financial saving arising from the 1% uprating. But it's not difficult to calculate because the uprating of welfare benefits is determined by the annual inflation rate in the September preceding the April when benefits are, are uprated. So, you know, there is an uprating due next month, which is based on last September's CPI in, in inflation rate. Now, we know what that was. You know, I think it was 1.2% in, in, in last September, if the, if the figure is, 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 is correct. Or perhaps it was a little bit lower. I'd have to, I'd have to double check on the figures. But we, we can look at what the actual inflation has been and compare that with what the expected inflation was on the OBR statistics. You know, what the expected inflation was at the time the Treasury said, oh, we're going to save X from, um, uh, from, from all of this. And we've revised down the, um, uh, the expected savings to the Treasury arising from the 1% uh, the uprating because of lower uh, inflation. Now, if, if inflation... You know, goes well below one percent and stays below one one percent. Then a one percent up rating is actually a, an increase in the real value um, of, um, of of benefits. But over the three year period that the one percent up rating 
has at least initially been uh, been put in place, um, it still represents a, re a reduction in real terms in, in, in benefit payments, but not as large as the initially anticipated reduction. Have I explained that well enough? Um, it's an explanation, yes. <laughs> no, well, have, 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 have I gone through the logic for, of, 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 of what I've for, for which I thank you. Um, can I ask you further about um, another um, constant which um, you've observed, and, and that is this, this difficult issue of what it means if people are in work and they're getting increased um, benefit from higher personal tax allowances. And I noticed you used a figure, you said you thought that for those in work and therefore um, receiving the benefit of tax credits, you thought um, the benefit from the increase in the personal tax exemption was probably about 1500 I'm just interested, Professor um, Fothergill, where that comes from. Oh, the, the 1500 is, is very much a, a sort of finger in the, in the wind figure. You've got, you've got to ask yourself, what would personal uh, tax allowances have been if there had not been the pressure from actually the, the, uh, the Liberal Dem Democrat part of the, of the coalition to, um, to increase uh, personal tax allowances to, to their present level? It's a counterfactual um, uh, question that we can't answer accurately. But... Just speculatively, we're, we're here we're saying that if personal tax allowances are £1,500 a year higher than they otherwise would have been, then you can trace that through in terms of the amounts of financial saving. And it would have been £300 a year for uh, a sole earner household, £600 a year for a double income household at, at the standard rate of income tax. And then I can set that against the, um, the losses arising from welfare reform, which uh, you know, vary according to type of household, but for a household with dependent children, it's about 1,500. So your 1,500, is that where there's one parent or two parents? Um, that's, an average, the, for, that's an average loss for all households with dependent children, that, that 1,500. It's averaging the lone parents with dependent children and the, and the couples with dependent children. Um, it's, it, it's the average loss for all households with dependent children, 1550 a year. Yeah? Uh, compared to benefit, uh, her tax benefit, tax, the tax allowance benefit being worth £600 for a double income household, £300 for a, a, a single person household, mm -hmm. if we're assuming that personal tax allowances are 1500 higher than they otherwise would have been. Okay. And just a couple of questions, Convener. Um, I notice that uh, on page 12 of the report at table 3, which is entitled Groups Typically Most Affected by Individual Welfare Reforms, you come to child benefit and you see all households with children a little, households with higher earners a lot. And I just was interested to know, um, where does your higher earner figure start? Well, we're work working from the, um, you know, the... the the rules on this um, um, if there is a higher earning house if there is a household with an earner who, whose income is sixty thousand pounds a year uh, then they lose all their entitlement to child benefit and it's tapered between fifty and sixty thousand pounds pounds a year those those are the um, uh, the treasury regulations on, on on child benefits so it starts disappearing at 50 uh, and above 60 it it, it goes um, and we have figures, yeah. I mean, the average loss for, for a higher earner household um, in terms of child benefit, we ask, it's £1,500 a year. It's not negligible. Um, and it's 90,000 households in, in, in Scotland. That's in, that's in Table 4. For those earning between fifty and £60,000? So for, for those earning above 50000 So that's including not just the, 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 the lo partial losers... Between fifty and sixty thousand, but above sixty thousand, you lose all your child benefit. Um, it's all now means tested for the higher earners. Um, so the, the, these are significant losses, and it, it's a very different reform from the other ones. I mean, when we've mapped out the geography of, of these and produced lo lovely coloured-in maps on and so many of the welfare reforms, you you get dark areas where the hits are hardest, which are in the most deprived areas 
uh, in Scotland are or indeed across GB. You map out the, the impact of the child benefit reforms and in particular the, the withdrawal from, uh, from higher earners and, and, and the map is absolutely the opposite. It's, it's, the, um, high, it's the better off areas that are hit hardest by that particular element of the, of the reform package. And I was interested in <coughs> Table 1, uh, Professor, which is on page 7, which I, I wasn't quite clear if this was just uh, an arithmetical extrapolation from all the data which you had gathered. Because when I looked at the heading Loss Per Working Age Adult and a uh, list of figures detail bring out a total of £440, I mean... Could I go and meet such an adult in Scotland? Does such an adult exist, or is that just a consequence of arithmetic? It is a consequence of arithmetic. There may be, um, you know, an adult uh, that actually fits that that average, um, uh, but like all averages, um, there is a spread uh, around it. Um, but when the welfare reforms, um, you know, impact differently on different places. You need some yardstick against um, which to, to measure their impact. And, and the way we've measured the impact in Scotland, or indeed in its constituent local authorities and wards, or indeed the way we've measured it in other parts of the United Kingdom, is, is, is we've measured the impact averaged across all adults of working age. Um, you know, that gives us a handle on, on, on how intensively Scotland is hit compared to you know, South East England or South Wales or, or, or wherever else. So 440 is the average financial loss spread across everybody between the age of 16 and 64 here in, in, in Scotland. Many people will lose nothing. A lot of people will lose a lot more than 440. It's the average loss. I don't think, well, look hard enough, you will always find someone who is on the average, but it, 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 is, it is a statistical concept. I'm just wondering, though, how meaningful a statistical concept it is. Well, I mean, how, how, how please don't misunderstand me. I think your report is is fascinating, and I think there's very useful data in it. Um, but what I didn't quite understand when I read Table One was, well, what does that tell us? What does it do to help us? I well, mean, yeah, well, well, Table One. There's, there's two columns in, in in Table One, isn't there? There's the there's the column tell it, telling you how much in absolute terms Scotland um, can expect to lose from each of the uh, welfare reforms. And, and we're coming to a total of just over 1.5 billion, 1,500 million uh, a year when everything has is, is come to um, full fruition. Now, if we have that figure in isolation, what does that mean? I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you compare Scotland with other parts of the United Kingdom? Uh, you've, got, you've got to say per something or other, per, per head of population, or in this instance, per adult of working age. And we've scaled it all against per adult of working age. Um, because the welfare reforms impact overwhelmingly on adults of working age, not pensioners. Um, so we, we, that, we, we found that to be the best guide. So that then enables us to move on further in the analysis and say, actually, the losses in Scotland are about the same as the national average. Uh, national GB average, but less than the average hit in Wales, less than the average hit in Northern England or in London, but substantially more than the average hit in, in parts of South East England outside of London. We've got, we've got to be able to scale those absolute losses against something. Uh, uh, yes, but you won't, you won't necessarily find that person who suddenly has lost £440 from their back pocket. Thank you very much, Professor. Okay, clear you wanted to come in with a supplementary. Yeah, it was, it was back to the child benefit reforms. Um, obviously, um, great concerns about how that was implemented in terms of a household may have an income of £98,000 a year, but an individual between fifty and 60000 earning that will be, more Im Im uh, be impacted in, in the same way. Did you do any analysis or could you comment on what the impact of, of single parent families are in the higher earner categories? Yeah, I, I think there is a, there is a table um, uh, in here. Let me just... Yeah, in, in table five, which is one of those great big matrices, um, we, ha we have estimates of the, the number of households 
of each type affected by each element of the welfare reforms. And we've, with child benefit, we've split it up into its two component parts, the freeze which affects everybody, and then the withdrawal from higher earners. Um, and that's over in, uh, they're about two-thirds of the way, three-quarters of the way along the, col the columns there. So you can see that, say, lone parents with one dependent child, we estimate that there are 101,000 households in Scotland who are affected by the child benefit freeze, but only 2,000 lone parents with one dependent child who actually lose because of the higher earner uh, withdrawal. Uh, and it's also a further 2,000 lone parents with two or more children affected by the higher earner withdrawal. Whereas if you look a little bit further up in that column, um, uh, the, the withdrawal from higher earners uh, is much bigger numbers for couples with children. 47,000 um, uh, couples with one child, 40,000 couples with two or more dependent children uh, losing because of the higher earner withdrawal um, so as a generality I suppose you know it would be the case that the the withdrawal from higher earners does not by and large fall on lone parents it falls on couples but for an individual household um, and as we've already talked about that's likely to be a woman that that could impact severely on, a, on that household in terms of a comparison of a, a couple's income in that situation well with, with, with these in the grand picture of things, these are better off households. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you, even if they are lone parent households, the, the lone parent will still have to be earning more than £50,000 a year uh, for, for the uh, withdrawal of child benefit uh, to begin to kick in. So uh, we're not on about the very poorest. Um, uh, we should log that point. Oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. It's just an, another example of what I think may be a gender issue in terms of, of women being more affected in general, by welfare reform than others. Um. <laughs> yes. As you see, we're, we're only estimating in Table 7 that lone parents, um, lone parents with one child only 2% of the financial loss. You know, we've got that big financial loss of, what is it, about £1,800 a year, for £1,700 a year for, for, for lone parents on average. We only think 2% of that uh, is attributable to the withdrawal um, uh, of child benefit from higher earners. Uh, whereas you look at couples with, with one child, 27% um, of the overall financial loss is attributable to that withdrawal from higher earners. I think it's, it's down to the, the numbers involved in that category again yeah, yeah. and most, the individual most impact. Most parents are not highly paid individuals. Yeah, uh -huh. and Some averages, will be. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yep, that's fine. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Um, that appears to have concluded the questions, uh, Steve. Thanks very much again for a very comprehensive uh, run-through of, of your findings and thanks again for actually providing those findings for us. I wait with interest the the future work that you're doing. Um, I'm sure there's, there's more to be drilled down into as, as we see these um, benefits uh, changes uh, rolling out. So there's, there's a lot more that we, we, we will have to look into. And you want to ha make a contribution before you, you close anything that you want to add? Yeah, I, I, I'll just say, Chair, that um, I, I hope in co covering some old territory that must be familiar to you in, 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 uh, in, in this report, that I've helped bring some of the members of the committee up to speed on, on, on the previous estimates, albeit they are now revised, but the previous estimates we've been producing of the impacts in, in, in Scotland, and you understand the basis um, of those. We are into new and unknown territory now in exploring the impact of all of this on labour market participation and employment levels. And I'm as fascinated as, as anybody to try to get to the bottom uh, of that. I mean, you can see that we have hunches as to what we may find, but there's nothing better than evidence. And, and, and we believe very strongly in hard, quantified evidence, which is what we keep trying to bring to you. And we do appreciate that. And we've, we've taken hard evidence on a number of areas, uh, sanctions, um, food banks, 
the actual direct impact of, of welfare uh, changes. Unfortunately, those who are uh, behind those uh, figures and creating those changes are in denial of the information that we're receiving, but we'll keep plugging away and try and convince them that the evidence is there uh, to show just exactly what's happening and the contribution you've made to that is, is very welcome on behalf of the committee. I'd like to thank you for that. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll suspend, uh, close the meeting to the public uh, at the present time. Um, before doing so, just to point out that our ne next meeting on the 24th of March, we expect to take oral evidence from the chair of the Social Security Advisory Committee, Paul Gray. Okay, thanks very much.